Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have Karthik with us with his talk on Cube Me This, Cuban and Best Practices. Uh, I think, Karthik, you're good to go. Yep, sounds good. Um, thank you. And um, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for staying late today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some Kubernetes stuff. Uh, this is going to be like a fast, uh, fast kind of session because I was trying to cut down on points, but then I thought it would be important to, um, you know, actually have them in there. So I want, you know, touch on the, the presentation bullet by bullet. Uh, I'll put the presentation uh, in the link uh, for, you know, for download. And you can just, you know, take a look at all the points specifically um, from, from that point, from that point of view. So welcome. Uh, you know, my name is Karthik uh, Gekwad. You can find me on Twitter uh, at iteration one. Um, I used to work at Oracle until a few months ago uh, in their, uh, Kubernetes and uh, cloud side of the house, but I recently joined a company called Verica, uh, and I'm the head of cloud native engineering. So I'm still doing a lot of Kubernetes stuff. So I mentioned, you know, I was on the managed Kubernetes team for Oracle, uh, then developer relations for Oracle Cloud. Uh, I've done a ton of stuff with respect to DevOps and Kubernetes. Um, you know, I have a course on Kubernetes and cloud native stuff on uh, LinkedIn Learning, uh, and uh, all of this got started because I had a very popular uh, Hello World Docker container. Uh, on, on Docker Hub. So I've been kind of in the ecosystem for a really long time. Um, one quick thing, if you want to learn more about chaos engineering, uh, Verica or does the O'Reilly book, uh, chaos engineering written by Casey and Nora, uh, you can actually get this book free, the, uh, the PDF version of it, because everyone keeps asking us, what is chaos engineering, blah, blah, blah. So you can get the book at, uh, verica.io, uh, you know, slash book. So today, uh, we're going to talk about Kubernetes and, uh, you know, I, I get, uh, beginner questions about Kubernetes a lot. And I think, uh, it's the best way to frame this conversation is to, uh, do it around three things, uh, development, uh, and the architecture portion of Kubernetes, uh, and how you like deploy your applications, uh, DevOps. And then, uh, if there are agile folks or, you know, uh, management kind of folks, uh, in the talk, uh, we could talk about enterprise transformation and how that plays a role. Uh, I already see questions. Okay, great. Um, if you have questions, you know, yeah, you can put it in, in the discuss section. I'll get to it at the end. Uh, and if not, um, you know, just find me in the lounge and we can, we can talk about stuff. So let's take a look at development and architecture specifically. Uh, whenever we talk about Kubernetes um, yeah, and building applications, uh, everybody's talking about microservices. Uh, and if you don't know what microservices are, uh, and if you're not sure kind of where to, where to start with microservices, uh, one thing I would recommend is take a look at the, uh, 12 factor app design. So this has kind of been around for, uh, eight, 10 years or 10, 12 years, I think, uh, at this point in time. Uh, and it's 12 factor.net and it's built on some of the principles, uh, when Heroku was doing development for software design and deployment. Uh, they were like, hey, we should follow some of these principles to make our uh, uh, development and deployment uh, lives a lot easier, uh, not just for the development engineers, but also like for the DevOps side of the house. So if you're working in really large companies, it actually really helps out uh, because you can bring, you know, the whole team kind of together. Um, I had like a couple more slides on that, but I put like I kind of hit them, uh, but they'll be in the slides. Uh, specifically about, you know, what, what is 12 factor, et cetera, uh, in the, in the notes. So, uh, let's move on to design patterns. Um, when people talk about Kubernetes and if you've never used Kubernetes before, uh, the, probably the place to start is, uh, it's called a Kubernetes deployment. Uh, and, uh, deployment, uh, there's many constructs in Kubernetes. So, uh, there's, you know, deployments and pods and services. And when you look at it the first time, this can be really overwhelming, but uh, I think like uh, 70 to 80% of everything that people deploy in, in clusters that I've seen have been uh, surrounding deployments. So it's the most common Kubernetes object that are used for applications that run inside of Kubernetes. And uh, deployment is basically like a specification. You can think of it as a specification. Uh, and in that specification, it's used to create a replica set and then the pods associated with that. The pods are actually the containers, you know, that package your application. Uh, and, you know, those are the things that run that. But, um, you know, the, the question that I get uh, most often is, hey, I have this uh, monolith application. I'm trying to run this in Kubernetes um, and I don't know how to do that. Can you tell me more about the architecture? 
So if we if we take this specific use case in mind, uh, you kind of have two choices. So uh, a good way to think of this is either uh, you can take your big application and use a single deployment model, or you can take your application and then if you have like developers uh, that can help you, you can kind of break it up into do a multi-deployment model. So what does this mean? Uh, yeah, if, you know, single, I talked about you know, one, one single object for your whole application uh, backed by a bunch of pods behind the scenes. So if you're taking like, if you have this one big Java file, like a war file, uh, and it has all the different portions of your application. You can take that and deploy it as a single unit. Or, uh, you know, the multi uh, idea is to kind of break it up before you um, bring it into Kubernetes and then run those um, as, uh, you know, separate applications that might work together, you know, uh, either like via HTTP or, you know, some kind of communication uh, between uh, between all the different components. So this is like analogy in the Java world is, um, if you have like many war files for your app, uh, you would kind of deploy them as deployments in Kubernetes. Uh, kind of moving on, uh, when you start running Kubernetes in production, uh, it gets confusing. So you have uh, you know multiple deployments equals multiple pods. Uh, and then when you're trying to deploy everything at once, uh, one common state that I've seen a lot is uh, when pods uh, take, a, take a while to actually come online. Uh, and folks are like, wait, I thought, you know, everything is supposed to run in a timely manner. What happens? But you end, in, end up in this weird state of like things actually not working or not running, et cetera. Um, so what do you do? There's uh, when you're building your, your YAML, your deployment YAML, there's a couple of probes that you could use for this. Uh, one is called the liveness probe and the other one is called the readiness probe. Uh, I kind of think of them more as, um, as health checks. So the readiness probe is where the user defines health checks that tells Kubernetes like when the container is ready to go uh, and serve requests. So uh, you know it can have like all the startup stuff that it needs to do. If it needs to like configure a token database, uh, you know make the state ready, etc. Uh, you know that uh, the readiness probe will uh, wait for the container and not start the deployment until all of those checks pass. And from a liveness pro, pro perspective, uh, it's a health check to indicate whether like a container is running or not. So uh, over time, you can kind of check like an endpoint or, you know, run a script, et cetera, to make sure that, um, you know, the container is still running okay. If that if that fails, then Kubernetes will kill the container um, and spawn like a brand new one. I put a link to the docs, um, but this is something that people forget uh, a lot initially. So, you know, it's kind of like a best practice. So take a look at it. Uh, and then also when you're working with multiple deployments, uh, it's better to have like a version endpoint uh, for your pods or containers. So that way you know like what actually you're running. Uh, one strategy that, you know, I've started following uh, over the past like five years or so is uh, to basically be able to tie whatever's running in your production back to your source control. So, um, you know, I recommend like uh, if you're using GitHub or something, have a Git hash that's you know, deployed in your version endpoints. So you can say, okay, I'm sure that I have this version of my code uh, running in my production system. So you have some kind of tie back to uh, whatever you have in your source, con source control. Uh, because typically what happens is, you know, you'll deploy these uh, multiple times and then you won't really know what you're actually running uh, in production. So it's kind of like a important thing uh, from that standpoint. Uh, let's kind of move on to a different section that I also get a lot of questions on, which is authentication authorization. Uh, basically, the uh, there's there's two things in Kubernetes. There's the authentication portion uh, and the authorization portion. If you've never dealt with this in Kubernetes, probably the most important thing to realize is the the idea of a user doesn't really uh, exist in Kubernetes. So if you're in AWS or something like that, and if you're trying to like use your AWS user uh, inside of the Kubernetes ecosystem, like there, it, there's no like easy way to like plug those two things in. You kind of have to do all of the management yourself uh, to do that. So uh, basically, but that being said, there's actually many ways to be able to authenticate. So that's kind of that's kind of nice. Um, and you know, there's a bunch of ways uh, you can kind of take a look at the docs uh, for you know which way might suit your specific use case the most uh, because there's kind of different ways and enterprises have uh, different ways of doing, doing that. Um, but the most important thing is, you know, make sure you actually pick an authentication 
for for your cluster because if you don't pick an authentication section, um, you can't actually pick an authorization strategy, and that's actually ends up being more important. Um, and you know, a lot of applications today actually expect you to have like an authorization strategy, uh, you know, for your cluster. So if you don't have anything, then you know things start to fall apart. Um, in terms of like what to pick uh, for authorization, there are different modules for it um and probably like the only thing to talk about here is uh you know there's there's two big ones in the ecosystem there's a uh, uh, attribute based and then there's role based uh, uh attribute based was the like the first model that they had created so you you end up finding like a lot of documents etc for that but uh tr truth is everyone has kind of evolved uh and actually ends up using rbac um, so, you know, use that as your standard versus uh, versus something else, uh, like well, versus ABAC or uh, something like that. You can also use multiple authorizers together, uh, but there's very like small subset of use cases for that. Um, if you want to learn more, you know, you can come uh, chat with me in the lounge after that. And I can tell you some stories on uh, using Webhook and RBAC together. So logging and monitoring, uh, this topic ends up being very important to the DevOps folks um, and how to kind of go about that. Um, you know, you can actually run a kubectl command called kubectl logs uh, and you can follow logs, et cetera. Um, but, you know, we all know from experience that um, you, you never catch the issues at the time. You're actually trying to find like past issues. So how do you look at, you know, log files um, beforehand so, uh, you know, think about logging and monitoring uh, early on before before you go into production uh, with Kubernetes. Uh, and more importantly, the thing that's um, essential is to tell your engineers how to actually use the tooling. So, um, you know, how to actually log, uh, debug and monitor because otherwise there's this time gap of, okay, we're in production, oh, something went wrong. Uh, and hey, there's a problem with your code and then nobody knows how to use, you know, uh, EFK or uh, Prometheus or Datadog or whatever uh, tool they're using. Um, so yeah, basically like more time front to play with the tooling gives you lesser time to actually debug uh, productions. So uh, in, in terms of like specific recommendations or tools, et cetera, if you're going the open source route, there is the you know EFK, which is the Elastic uh, Stack, FluentD and Kibana for, for logging, uh, you know, if, if you're in an enterprise, you already use Splunk or, you know, you use uh, Sumo Logic or something like that, those have adapters to Kubernetes. Uh, same thing for, for monitoring or and observability. Uh, the, if you're doing it from an open source point of view, Prometheus and Grafana are like the two major ways. But if you use something like Datadog or, or uh, you know, any other tooling, you can, those have like, see, uh, that, that has uh, Kubernetes plugins as well. So all of this stuff wouldn't really exist without containers. Um, so what are some best practices? Um, containers uh, are based on images. So from an image perspective, the smaller the image, uh, the better. So there's less things for an exploiter to attack. Uh, and also like from a practical basis, if you have a, you know, a one gig image that has like all of the Java JDK, et cetera, in it uh, and everything that you need. And if you don't need it, like why actually push that and pull that uh, every single time? Um, also, this is more specific. Uh, don't rely on the tag. A latest image uh, yesterday might be different from what it is today. It might be different from tomorrow. So you might not know what version you're actually running with. So it's better to tag it with a, a specific version uh, that you're operating with. Um, and also, like consider using a private registry. So you, you know you're. Uh, it's a lot of like company IP that you're storing. So you know you enterprises have different concerns for data storage. Uh, when I worked at Oracle, like most of our clients ended up using, um, you know, an, uh, a private registry in order to do that. So, you know, if you're in the cloud, a lot of every cloud provider has their own registry that's a little bit more secure uh, than using Docker Hub. So, you know, consider consider something like that. Uh, so moving on to the DevOps side of the house, uh, the most common question is like, should I install my own Kubernetes or should I use a managed service? What do you do? Uh, so pros and cons. Uh, from a cons perspective, um, it's not 100% customizable. Uh, if you're using, you know, like uh, EKS or, uh, um, you know, Azure Kubernetes service, uh, there might be hidden costs. So load balancers, um, if you're provisioning load balancers inside of, uh, you know, a cloud provider, those actually cost money. So there might be like hidden costs like that. Um, 
but from a pro perspective, you are not, you don't have to care about the control plane management. So the provider handles that for you. There's a lot less uh, maintenance that your DevOps team has to handle. And you're actually spending more time with your applications uh, and the nodes that support the applications versus, you know, like, oh, why is, uh, you know, why is Kubelet down on a specific node, et cetera. So moving on to what are different strategies for, you know, dev test production, I think I have uh, two more minutes uh, to go. So I'll kind of go a little bit faster. But um, I think there's two primary strategies. Uh, it's either use different namespaces uh, in a single cluster uh, or different use different clusters for dev test production. Um, most folks that I talked to, like I think two years ago, a lot of people would use, you know, different namespaces for dev test production uh, inside one cluster. Um, this was because it was actually really hard to, uh, you know, create a Kubernetes cluster I think most people have kind of evolved to using multiple clusters um, uh, for, you know, one for dev, one for test, one for production, et cetera. So it's, there's like separation of concerns and it's become like really easy um, to, you know, be, be able to create clusters, especially if you're using cloud. So that's my recommended approach for enterprises, especially if you're using, you know, uh, any of the big four cloud providers. Um, the, the con is that you do have more environments to manage. But I think that outweighs the benefit of, oh, I broke development. And as a result, I also broke uh, production. So tagging nodes, um, all of these things, uh, you know, when you're running your workloads, you run them on nodes. Uh, and if you have like multiple clusters, and if you have a three node cluster, and if you have like five different clusters, you already have 15 nodes. So, you know, Kubernetes has a concept of tags. So use those tags to tag the node. So when you look at your AWS screen, uh, you can at least know like what nodes came from what cluster, et cetera. Um, that you can, I have a link to the docs over here, but uh, you know, more more importantly, just remember to tag your nodes. Uh, and then from a pipeline perspective, uh, consider using a pipeline. So, um, you know, I can talk about this more in details uh, when, you know, if, uh, if, if folks are interested uh, in the lounge, but you can kind of ac accomplish all these four things using CI CD tooling. Uh, you know, we we at Verica, we end up using Serp guy behind the scenes to do a lot of this work. So you can kind of like, uh, you know, follow a similar infrastructure. Um, and then from a transformation point of view, uh, I think the, the big thing is like, where, uh, where do we start? How do I do this? Um, so my recommended approach uh, for folks that are new to the Kubernetes eco ecosystem is like, get some experience with Kubernetes first. Like, don't commit to saying, hey, we are going to do Kubernetes. Like, Make sure it actually works with your workloads. Uh, you know, take an application, either split it apart or run it uh, as a single thing, convert that into Kubernetes, uh, and then take that application uh, and, you know, uh, promote it to run in a production production setting and then understand how to do the DevOps stuff behind the scenes for that. Because, uh, you know, it's easy to build something for Kubernetes, but it's harder to figure out, you know, when things go wrong, how do you, how do you manage that? And then, you know, once you're comfortable with one app, uh, you know, you can add multiple things in there. Uh, that's how, like, most folks, you know, uh, take a look at this. Uh, and also, from, from a high level, like, know your team. Uh, every organization is a little bit different. So uh, build your uh, cloud-native transformation around your teams. If you're very uh, DevOps-heavy, uh, you know, you can uh, do a lot more things from, a, from that standpoint. Um, and so, but organize into, like, development, DevOps, and SRE teams to kind of uh, use the different... Um, uh, you know, the different facets. Uh, also leverage uh, the community for Kubernetes and cloud native is really big. So leverage open source technologies where it makes sense. And you can take a look at the landscape on cncf.io. So have, I guess I am out of time. Thank you so much, Karthik, for being with us.